On the 8th of February 1587, inside of the walls of Fotheringhay Castle, a small and modest fortification, the Queen of Scotland made her final steps towards the executioner's scaffold. She was a woman who had crossed the English Queen a number of times, and because of this her death warrant had been signed. But Mary Queen of Scots' life was tragic, and she experienced a sharp downfall of her fortunes at the hands of her scheming husbands, ruthless political enemies, and bad luck. Mary was only six days old when her father died, and she inherited the throne of Scotland, but she was plagued by marriages that all ended in disaster. She was a Catholic queen, who upset many, who were backing the Scottish Reformation and changes to the church, and prominent preachers such as John Knox openly questioned her and claimed he did not have to obey the Catholic Queen. But for consenting to get involved in a number of schemes and plots against the English Queen, Elizabeth I, the Axeman was dispatched to Fotheringhay Castle, where Mary had been held, and she was executed in brutal fashion, and this did not go well. Join us today as we look at the execution of the unfortunate Mary Queen of Scots, and as always, to support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Mary was born on the 8th of December 1542 inside of Linlithgow Palace and her father was King James V and her mother was Mary of Guise. She was a great granddaughter of Henry VII through her grandmother Margaret Tudor but as mentioned six days after her birth her father died and this left Mary to inherit the throne of Scotland. The crown had come to a queen and Scotland was ruled by regents until she became an adult and there were many who fought for the position to practically rule the nation for the young queen. But her early life was dominated by a number of other monarchs, wanting to secure her hand in marriage for their children, as King Henry VIII of England sought to propose marriage between Mary Queen of Scots and Edward VI, his own son, to bring a union between Scotland and England, and the Treaty of Greenwich was signed, that promised, at the age of ten, Mary and Edward would marry, and Henry VIII would then oversee her upbringing. But Henry VIII wanted to break the old alliance between France and Scotland, and there was concern that Mary would be taken by the English. She was crowned inside of Stirling Castle's chapel on the 9th of September 1543, but then the War of the Rough Wooing emerged to force Mary's marriage to Edward as Henry VIII's troops raided many Scottish lands and cities. But the treaty was broken as the King of France, Henry II, proposed to unite the French and Scottish crowns by marrying Mary to his three-year-old son, the Dauphin Francis. Mary was then moved to France at the age of five, and she spent 13 years inside the French court. She was accompanied by two half-brothers and four young girls named Mary and a governess. She was considered a clever and beautiful student who impressed everyone at the French court, but her mother-in-law, Catherine de' Medici, was not impressed. She was so by the standards of the 16th century, a very tall woman, and she was the opposite to her husband Francis, who was rather short, but the pair claimed they were both in love. Mary Queen of Scots did have a claim though to the English throne, and in England many believed that the Catholic girl should have succeeded to the English crown. But when Henry II died on the 10th of July 1559, Mary and Francis became the Queen and King of France. However, this would not be a long reign, as King Francis II died on the 5th of December 1560 of an ear infection that caused an abscess on his brain, and Mary was left heartbroken. She was then sent back to Scotland, and she claimed her throne, but she was very much a fish out of water, and she had very little experience in dealing with the dangerous landscape of Scottish politics. As she was a Catholic, she was dealt with by many with suspicion, and the country was split between Catholic and Protestant factions, and John Knox preached against her and condemned her. But Mary was rather tolerant compared to other monarchs, and she even dispatched ambassadors to the English court to propose her as the heir presumptive to the English throne following Elizabeth I's death. There were arrangements for Elizabeth and Mary to meet in England, at Nottingham or York, in September 1562, but this was cancelled. Following her disastrous first marriage, Mary then tried to find another husband, and Elizabeth I suggested her own love and favourite, the Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley, as she believed she could control the Scottish Queen through Dudley. But she chose to marry Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, her English-born half-cousin. Darnley was also a grandchild of Margaret Tudor, the sister of Henry VIII, and he was a very tall man that Mary described as long, 
and he was well over six foot tall. Darnley and the Queen married at Holyrood Palace on the 29th of July 1565. Mary insisted on the marriage, and this may have been an indication of her love. However, the union between the pair was not happy for long. Darnley was an arrogant man and was not happy to be King Consort, and he wanted to co-reign alongside his wife or in his own name, and he was refused this request, which infuriated him. This led to him growing very jealous of any man in the Queen's company, including David Rizzio, the private secretary of Mary, who some claimed was the father of Mary's child, that she was now with, as she had fallen pregnant. But in March 1566, Rizzio was slaughtered inside of Holyrood Palace, in front of the pregnant Mary, and he was stabbed to death, and stabbed many times. Darnley became violent, and he also became a drunk, and was greatly frustrated with his standing in Scotland. However, Mary gave birth to a son, named James, on the 19th of June 1566, inside of Edinburgh Castle. But she met with other leading nobles then to deal with the problem of Darnley, and divorce was discussed, but some lords wanted to remove him by other means. Darnley feared for his life, and he went to Glasgow to live on his father's land, where he then became rather ill from a fever or a serious illness, and some believed he was poisoned. Lord Darnley recovered in a house belonging to the brother of Sir James Balfour, at the former Abbey of Kirk O'Field, and Mary visited him frequently. It looked as if they would reconcile, but this never happened. In the early hours of the 10th of February 1567, the 20-year-old Lord Darnley was found dead in the garden of his house, and there had been a serious explosion that had gutted the house where he was staying. Darnley, though, had been strangled and had not been blown to pieces, meaning he was actually murdered. Mary herself fell under suspicion, and Elizabeth I wrote to her of these rumours that reached English court. The English Queen wrote, I should ill fulfil the office of a faithful cousin or an affectionate friend if I did not tell you what all the world is thinking. Men say that instead of seizing the murderers, you are looking through your fingers while they escape, that you will not seek revenge on those who have done so much pleasure, as though the deed would have never taken place had the doers of it not been assured impunity. For myself, I beg you to believe that I would not harbour such a fault. But one man who was believed to be behind it was James Hepburn, the Earl of Bothwell, but he was acquitted at a trial. But Bothwell had other ideas, and he wanted to marry Mary for himself, and in April 1567, Mary was abducted by Bothwell and his troops, who told her that she was in danger, and she was then taken to Dunbar Castle. It's believed Bothwell subjected Mary to a horrific ordeal of assault, but she then was coerced to marry Bothwell, and the pair married inside of Holyrood Abbey, and it's believed she married him to try and end the chaos across the nation. But Mary believed that a number of other nobles supported the marriage, but this was far from the truth, and the match was incredibly unpopular, but Bothwell wanted the crown for himself. This led to a royalist army being pitted at Carberry Hill, against the forces of 26 Scottish peers. There was no fight, battle or bloodshed, but Mary's forces backed off, and the Lords took Mary to Edinburgh, when she was then imprisoned inside of Loch Leven Castle, in the middle of Loch Leven. She then suffered a miscarriage of twins, and was forced to abdicate in favour of her one-year-old son James, with the Earl of Murray being made the regent. Mary did manage to escape from Loch Leven, and she raised an army of 6,000, and met the smaller forces of Marais at the Battle of Languid in May 1568, and she then fled south after defeat. She crossed into England, and she was taken into the custody of the English Queen at Carlisle Castle, and Mary expected Elizabeth I to help her regain her throne, but the English Queen was hesitant to help her do this. Because of this, Mary was then moved between a number of different houses and castles around England, and she was held as a prisoner of the English Queen. In Scotland, Mary's supporters were fighting civil war for her against the Regent Murray, but Mary refused to acknowledge the power of a court to try her believing she was above the law. Regent Murray presented the casket letters at trial, eight letters unsigned from Mary to Bothwell, including marriage contracts and love sonnets, and Mary denied writing these. It became clear to the Scottish Queen, though, that there would be no help from the English to help her regain her crown and throne. She was moved inside of different houses for her own safety, 
and as Elizabeth I believed she would be broken out of prison. She experienced various different treatments in these castles and properties, and she was placed in the custody of the Earl of Shrewsbury and his wife, the infamous Bess of Hardwick. In her imprisonment, Mary was allowed her own staff of many people, and a huge number of carts were needed to transport her belongings from house to house. Her chambers were decorated with rich tapestries and the cloths of state, and she lived a life of luxury. She even spent time on holiday being allowed under supervision to visit the spa town of Buxton. But she kept herself busy by exercising, and also by sewing. However, Elizabeth I's spymaster Walsingham over the years would discover a number of plots involving Mary. For Catholics across England, many believe that the Protestant Elizabeth I was not the legitimate heir to the throne, that the real heir was in fact Mary Queen of Scots. Elizabeth's mother was Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's executed second wife, and with this many disregarded her as a legitimate queen, and Mary they turned to to rule over them. She was probably fed up with her imprisonment too, and Mary would later consent to one plot that secured her death. The first plot, the Ridolfi plot, would have seen Elizabeth replaced with Mary, using Spanish troops, and the Duke of Norfolk then consented to marry Mary, to then rule as the king, but this resulted in his execution. A further plot, the Throckmorton plot was discovered with the same goal, execute Elizabeth I and place Mary on the throne of England. It was clear to anyone around her that Mary served as a real threat to the English Queen, but she would then, in August 1586, be implicated in the Babington plot. This plot was a step too far for the English Queen, and proof was found that Mary had consented to it, which would have seen Elizabeth I assassinated, then Mary would have been made Queen of England, once Elizabeth was out of the way, in a Catholic uprising. Mary's signature and writing was found on these documents, and she had been trapped by Walsingham. Because of this, Mary was sent to Fotheringhay Castle, and she arrived there in September 1586. But the English Queen was confronted with this evidence, and she then authorised the trial of the Queen of Scotland, and she was placed on trial for treason under the Act for the Queen's Safety. A court of 36 noblemen, including the key advisers Cecil and Walsingham, heard the case, and Mary denied all of the charges, and she claimed, Look to your consciences, and remember that the theatre of the whole world is wider than the Kingdom of England. She claimed she did not have time to look at the evidence and to prepare a proper defence, and she also stated that she could not be tried for treason, as she had never been a subject of the English Queen, as she was a foreign, anointed monarch and queen. On the 25th of October, Mary Queen of Scots was sentenced to death, and everyone except one man agreed on this. But Mary was not executed quickly, as Elizabeth I hesitated to order the execution, in the face of pressure from her Privy Council, and she was gravely concerned about the consequences in sanctioning the execution of an anointed queen. She was worried that her son, King James VI of Scotland, would send armies to invade England, with Catholic forces from abroad also invading, but she was also concerned that executing a queen would lead to her later not getting into heaven when she died. She even asked her advisers if there was a way that they could shorten the life of Mary, instead of executing her, but her advisers claimed he would not make a shipwreck of my conscience or leave so great a blot on my poor posterity. With this it's likely Elizabeth thought she could bring about Mary's death, but on the 1st of February 1587 she finally signed the death warrant and this was then taken to Fotheringhay Castle. On the evening of the 7th of February 1587 Mary was told that she was to be executed the next morning as the death warrant had been signed. Because of the haste, workmen were brought into Fotheringhay Castle's Great Hall to create the execution scaffold, and this was then covered in black cloth in the centre of the hall, and it was reached by two or three steps. On the scaffold was also the block, and a cushion for the Queen of Scotland to kneel on when the time came to it, and there were three stools, one for her, and one for the Earl of Shrewsbury and the Earl of Kent, who were acting as official witnesses to the execution. One account of her execution exists, and it shows the brutality but the moving and sombre procession of Mary to her death. This lengthy account states, Her, Mary Queen of Scots's prayers being ended, the executioners, kneeling, desired her grace to forgive them her death, who answered, 
I forgive you of all my hearts for now. I hope you shall make an end of all my troubles. Then they, with her two women, helping her up, began to disrobe her of her apparel. Then she, laying her crucifix upon the stool, one of the executioners took from her neck the Agnes Day, which she, laying hands off it, gave to one of her women, and told the executioner he should be answered money for it. Then she suffered them, with her two women, to disrobe her of her chain of pomander beads, and all other her apparel, most willingly. And with the joy, and with joy rather than sorrow, helped to make unready herself, putting on a pair of sleeves with her own hands, which they had pulled off, and there was some haste, as if she had longed to be gone. All this time they were pulling off her apparel, she never changed her countenance, but with smiling cheer she uttered these words, that she had never had such grooms to make her unready, and that she had never put off her clothes before such a company. Then she being stripped of all her apparel, saving her petticoat and kirtle, the two women beholding her, made great lamentation, and crying and crossing themselves, prayed in Latin. She turning herself to them, embracing them, said these words in French, and so crossing and kissing them, bade them pray for her, and rejoice and not weep, for that now they should see, an end to all their mistress's troubles. Then she with a smiling countenance turning to her manservants, as Melvin and the rest, standing upon a bench nigh the scaffold, who sometime weeping, sometime crying out aloud, and continually crossing themselves, prayed in Latin, crossing them with her hand, bade them farewell, wishing them to pray for her, even until the last hour. This done one of the women, having a corpus Christi cloth, lapped up three corner ways, kissing it, put it over the Queen of Scots's face, and pinned it fast to the call of her head. Then the two women departed from her, and she kneeling down upon the cushion most resolutely, and without any token of fear or death, she spake aloud this psalm in Latin, in T dominin confido, non confidar in eternum. Then groping for the block, she laid down her head, putting her chin over the block with both her hands, which holding there still, had been cut off, had they not been espied. Then lying upon the block most quietly, and stretching out her arms, cried, in manus tuus dominin, three or four times. Then she lying very still upon the block, one of the executioners, holding her, slightly with one of his hands, she endured two strokes of the other executioner with an axe she making very small noise or none at all, and not stirring any part of her from the place where she lay, and so the executioner cut off her head, saving one little gristle, which being cut asunder, he lift up her head to the view of all the assembly, and bade God save the queen. Then her dress of lawn falling from off her head, it appeared as grey as one of three score and ten years old, pulled very short, her face in a moment being so much altered from the form she had, when she was alive, as few could remember her by her dead face. Her lips stirred up and down a quarter of an hour after her head was cut off. Then Mr. Dean, Dr. Fletcher, the Dean of Peterborough, said in a loud voice, So perish all of the Queen's enemies. And afterwards the Earl of Kent came to the dead body, and standing over it with a loud voice said, Such end of all the Queen's and the Gospel's enemies. Then one of the executioners pulling off her garters, espied her little dog, which was crept under her clothes, which could not be gotten forth but by force, yet afterwards would not depart from the dead corpse, but came to lay between her head and her shoulders, which being imbrued with her blood, was carried away and washed, as all things elsewhere that had any blood was either burned or washed clean, and the executioners sent away with money for their fees, not having any one thing that belonged unto her. And so every man being commanded out of the hall, except the sheriff and his men, she was carried by them up into a great chamber, lying ready for the surgeons to embalm her. This account confirms that Mary was not executed with one clean strike of the axe. The first blow which came down missed her neck, and embedded in the back of her head, and she could have been killed by this. But the second blow was much more successful, and it landed on its target, but did not completely separate her head from her body. The executioner then had to saw through this sinew with the axe. The executioner then picked up her head and claimed God save the queen, but he was holding it by her hair, but this was actually a wig, and the queen's head then slipped and fell onto the floor and rolled around the scaffold. 
It was a very undignified end for the Scottish monarch, and anything that touched her blood was thrown into the fire of the Great Hall to prevent any relics being collected. Elizabeth I was heartbroken when she heard of the news that Mary Queen of Scots had been executed, and she said that her instructions had been disobeyed, and she even imprisoned one of her advisers inside the Tower of London. But Mary had asked to be buried in France with her first husband Francis II, but this request was denied, as it may have been too costly, or Elizabeth deemed that someone condemned for treason should not be afforded this request in luxury. Her body was collected and placed in a coffin, and taken to Fotheringhay's presence chamber, where she was then embalmed. It's believed that her heart and vital organs were cut out, and then these were buried inside Fotheringhay Castle's grounds, and this vessel that they were placed in has never been found, and may still exist today. However, eventually, Elizabeth I was convinced to bury Mary Queen of Scots months after her execution, after her embalmed body was just left in a room in Fotheringhay Castle. It was selected that Peterborough Cathedral, the nearest cathedral to the place of her execution, was a suitable place to bury her, and she was then interred opposite the first wife of Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon. But when Elizabeth I died, Mary's son James became King James I of England, and he ruled England and Scotland, and he was dismayed at the treatment of his mother's remains, and he ordered a huge tomb of her to be constructed inside of Westminster Abbey, which was then exhumed in 1612, and was actually reinterred inside of this tomb, opposite the burial site of Elizabeth I. Mary Queen of Scots' burial vault was opened, and many of her descendants were placed inside of the vault. But she today is considered a tragic queen, whose fortunes were rather sour, but many believed that she was a pawn in the schemes of powerful Scottish nobles. But there are a few things that can't be disputed. Mary Queen of Scots had a number of terrible marriages, and she did consent to the Babington plot, as she was caught red-handed. It's likely that by the end of her life, that Mary had enough of being a prisoner of the English, and she saw execution and death as a way out of her suffering. She is remembered today as a woman who many believed was the rightful Queen of England, but also a queen who was executed by the final Tudor one. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.